start sharp at 501 another 90 seconds and then we go live Nate, how is the weather there today pretty rainy actually it's oh nice autumn is definitely here okay and were you able to experience some of the paris olympics yeah, it was amazing. It really was. We got to a couple of football games and uh, okay. yeah, there was just a great atmosphere. Okay. Our folks from India did reasonably well in the Paris Para Olympics. Oh, yeah. We got we got some 11 medals, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, we are very excited and happy out here in the country right now. <laughs> Super. And a lot of them whom you can't see in person today, some of them you may have met in January, February 23, when you were here in India. Mm -hmm. So maybe another minute and super. I think as promised always, XL1 is committed to run this quality movement together with each of you. And the first step for this quality movement, we took almost 18 months back when we had the launch for OECD's Peace of a School in India. And on the launch, we had some fantastic colleagues from OECD Paris, and one of them was Nate. So when we were to design this series of learning mission webinars with all of you, we kind of threw open the session for today. And I think Nate was one of the first few who said, I would love to meet my friends again. And I'm really grateful. Thank you so much, Nate, for accepting this request and joining us again. My pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Super. And so today we have exactly 60 minutes. We'll try to keep it within the 60 minutes, but I know uh, the flurry of questions that we have already received before the session, and I'm sure a lot many more questions will generate as you experience uh, the session. We will try to accommodate as much as possible. Maybe we'll stretch for five, seven minutes if Nate, uh, your calendar permits, but we'll try to keep it to 60, 60 minutes as much as possible. So uh, Nate, before I give the, give the, I can't say podium, before I give the spotlight to you fully for your presentation, uh, I, I had one thing which I wanted to open this session with. A lot of us, uh, not me, actually, I was, very good in math at school. But a lot of us generally had a fear of numbers. Mm -hmm. The moment you talk numbers, we are like, oh my God, that's tough. And today in this session, you can expect half of us to still be in that boat wherein we don't like numbers because maybe we never invested enough to understand numbers well. And now you are here to say how data is connected to learning outcomes and to our work in school. And we are scared about this. It's not just you. I think the whole world is talking about this and we are genuinely interested to go back to our school days when we should have got our data and math right, but we are happy to do it today in context of education and learning outcome. So with that, Nate, I would leave your introduction as well to you. I, I know I didn't do, do a good job when we were together here in India a couple of times and you know this audience already. So over to you, Nate, and after your presentation is over, we'll have good time for Q&A with our folks here. Great. Thanks, Kavish. I will just start sharing my screen. Um, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, yes. So Kavish has uh, sort of hinted a little bit at something. So I, I thought I'd start with an introduction about me. Some of you will have heard it from, from the Roadshow, but I'm sure there are new friends that I haven't met yet amongst the people here. Um, I started my career in education as, a, as an ESL teacher. Uh, teaching adults in Perth, Western Australia. And I was a high school teacher after that um, for a while. Uh, and I taught English and English as an additional language or dialect, which is what they call ESL in high schools in Western Australia. Um, and I always thought of myself as a as an English person, as, as a reading person. I was all about the stories and the movies and 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 all about uh, literature and and texts. And I never thought of myself as a maths person. Um, that didn't come till much, much later. And what happened was, um, as I was teaching in high schools, I started moving into the middle management 
And I got into positions where I needed to talk to teachers about assessment. And I didn't know enough about standardizing assessments or moderating assessments across multiple classrooms with different teachers that have different backgrounds. And so I went back to university and did some study. Um, and I found Roche measurement, which is um, the precursor of IRT, um, which is a it's a it's a quantitative field um, to do with um, developing assessments that are delivered at large scale. So things like your national assessments will have IRT behind them. And I discovered that actually what I'd been telling myself about not being a numbers person was not true. We all of us have room for growth. And sometimes we find things which just speak to us. And for me, it was educational measurement. And I discovered that I, I was able to do numbers. And I had to go back and I had to relearn some numbers and some statistics and some quantitative methods. But actually, when I had a reason to do it, it became easy. Um, and that led me on to becoming a test developer full time at the Australian Council for Educational Research, which has uh, an office in India and it is quite active. I'm sure most of you will have come across them at some point or another if you're interested in assessment um, and they work a lot with, with governments. So I was there for seven years um, developing tests. And, and again, it was reading and writing because that's what I, I leaned towards, but it was also the data that was behind it. And that led me to the OECD because I was in um, the Pisa for Schools program, which you've all signed up to, is about um, measuring and then exploring and acting on, on the data that's received. And that's gonna be a big theme of what I'm talking about today. Um, so I was in the Pisa for Schools team for a couple of years. I've recently moved to the Skills Beyond School team, um, but we're still all about measuring skills and knowledge and uh, understanding where people are and how to get people moving along the, 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 the course of their life towards greater heights. Um, you, We'll probably have seen this in Excel One's communications, but our piece of the schools is all about measure, explore, act. I'm not going to spend too long on it, but basically measuring is collecting the data. Exploring is looking into it to see what stories are in there. And then acting is making decisions based on what you found out um, in exploring the data. And today in particular, we're focusing on the explore and act. So we're not talking too much about specific numbers um, or what they mean. We're talking about how to approach exploring um, a report that you'll receive from PISA for schools. Um, and then I'm going to give you a couple of examples of case studies of some schools from around the world um, who have explored, asked themselves questions, and then implemented some things um, that they're very happy with. So how do we explore and act with PISA for Schools data? This is uh, a bit of a flowchart. It's a bit of a boring slide, I'm sorry, but um, it, it shows a couple of different things that you can do to approach your school report, either as a, as a school leader or as a school leadership group. It's often important to share reports with middle leaders and with leading teachers and up and coming leaders who might have ideas about how things could be done better within your school. The first thing, going from left to right, of course, is identifying areas for success, areas of success, and opportunities for growth. In every report, there will be things to celebrate, and it's important as school leaders you do celebrate what you are doing right. Um, whether that's how many students you have, how wonderfully they do in one particular area, or how happy they are at school, or there will be something in your report that you'll be able to find perhaps by yourself, perhaps with some other people reading it with you, um, that will be things you are doing well. And always, we never want to throw out the things we're doing well when we're talking about improvement. We want to add more things to that box. We don't want to get rid of anything that we're already doing well. And then we op identify opportunities for growth. I'd recommend that you keep it to a couple of things. You know, sometimes you get a report and there's just so much information but if you can come out with what you're doing well and then one or two things that are opportunities for growth, you're doing pretty well on exploring the reports. One of the things that comes next is, is questioning what you've found to wonder how the things that you've found fit with other sources of data because PISA for Schools is just one test 
and you will have other sources of data from your national assessments or from your teacher assessments or from observations of your teachers and students. So how does it fit in the bigger context of what you know about your school and how it's doing? And you need to wonder about whether what you see in the PISA for Schools report confirms or raises questions about what you're doing. Sometimes there's a mismatch, we'll be honest, okay? The way that PISA me measures things like reading might not be the way that your curriculum is, is structured or is set up. And so sometimes surprising results that you might initially worry about actually are things not to worry about. But sometimes after you think about how it fits with everything else you know and what else it's bringing to the table in terms of painting a complete picture of your school, it might raise some more questions. And those questions lead into the action. And you ask yourself and your leadership group, how can we use what we've learned to inform and change our practice? You know, if we've identified a problem, what are we going to do about it? What could we do about it? And in that stage, there's also the opportunity to go out and find other research and evidence that you can draw on to inform what's likely to be the most uh, impactful change that we can do. And research and evidence to inform change can also come from mentors. Of course, there are experts and there are consultants and there are people that you will have in your own lives who, who mentor you in your leadership journey. And they are also such a valuable source of input into choosing what are the next steps. And then once you've chosen what it is you're going to work on, you get into the nitty gritty. The methods are the how, the evidence collection. Do we need more evidence about particular things or do we need more fine-grained evidence about particular things? So reading is an example. If your reading scores in PISA for schools are something that you think you want to work on, what other evidence can you collect about how your students read or what they read or where they read or when they read or how much they read in class or out of class? What other evidence can you use to, to pull into to what you're doing? Um, and evidence collection is also after the intervention as well, of course, which is the checking. Um, and along the way, you need to share what you're doing. One of the ways to support change in school is to make sure everybody's invested. And so sharing why you're doing something, what you're doing, and what you hope to achieve with it, of course, brings everyone on the journey with you. So that's a really brief overview um, of what it means to explore and act and what we mean when we talk about exploring and acting in PISA for schools. Um, and of course, there's more than one way through these sorts of maps and there's more than one process, but this is one of the directions or one of the flows that you could look at. Um, informed by your own context and experience and information that you have to hand as well. Um, and now we've got a couple of examples and I just need to shift windows around my screen so I can see my whole slide. Um, so this is one example from a school group uh, in Portugal. So in, this is a couple of schools altogether that have a, a common school leadership, um, but they're based o over a small geographical spread. Um, when they went to explore their data, they were very happy with their academic report, with, with their academics, their reading, their, their science and their maths. And they were happy with a lot of what they read um, in the, the student questionnaire output as well. But they came to one figure, and it looks a little different on this screen because Portugal has a slightly different looking school report for a, a lot of reasons. But they came to this one figure that showed that their school in the orange dots was below the benchmarks that they'd picked of their national and, and the OECD benchmarks in terms of adaptive teaching practices. So there are three questions in the PISA for School student questionnaire that ask students directly, um, how frequently does your teacher adapt the lesson to the level of knowledge and needs of students in any class? How often does a teacher provide individualised support when a student has difficulty understanding a topic or task? And how often does a teacher change the lesson plan on a topic that most students are having difficulty understanding? So the, the point of these three questions is to get a gauge of how students feel about the responsiveness of the teacher to their needs. And not just their personal needs, but the needs of the students that they see in the classroom around them. 
And so for this group of schools in Portugal, they looked at this and they were like, well, we're, we're not too bad. I mean, teachers are doing this more than half the time on, on, on most of these questions, but a little bit less than half on that, that bottom one. Um, but we're not where we want to be. You know, we've set ourselves these goals of these benchmarks. We want to be the best in the world at this, or we want to be up there with the OECD and, and with our nation, with, with Portugal. So what are we going to do about it? So this, this was a challenge that they posed to themselves. We've found this thing. It's something we want to change about our group of schools. How do we do that? And so they took quite drastic action. Um, and I've got it on the right here, their act. So they analyzed the piece of the school's results with their middle leaders. So their you know, heads of department or, the, or their deputy principals that they got a leadership group involved. They didn't leave it just to the person at the top. They got, you know, some widespread support throughout their schools. They ran workshops and training on communication and on active methodologies. So teaching methods that were going to be active and responsive and, and trying to change the, the way their teachers were teaching to make them more responsive to student needs. Um, and they met, uh, in each subject area, they had a definition of proced procedures on how they were going to improve communication in the classroom. Because one of the things that they felt would help was that maybe the teachers don't know when the students are struggling, or maybe the students are too scared to tell the teacher. So maybe this is a communication issue about the teacher not realizing they need to adapt their practice or adapt what's going on. Or the flip side of it is perhaps the teachers need to be more explicit about when they are adapting so that the students are aware of it happening. Maybe the students aren't the best objective judges of teaching practices, and maybe it's just a matter of the teachers needing to communicate, oh, I can see you're struggling with this, let's do it this way instead, to let the students know they're being supported, even if they had been the whole time. And the other part of what they did was to make sure that students had, a, had more of a voice so they ran a series of meetings. So each class met with the principal and the executive of the school group, and they were able to discuss things that they thought about the school and thought that they could improve in the school to give the students a forum to talk directly to school leadership. They implemented more class assemblies at the beginning of each semester to reinforce this idea of dialogue with students. And they encourage active participation in the school. So getting out the message that this is the school is the, for the students and the students need to also get involved in everything that the school offers them. Um, and they, they told us about the results after, after they implemented these things. They said that they saw an increased student initiative and involvement in interdisciplinary and active citizen projects. So that was that active participation in the school. The, the school group told us that they saw an uptick in participation. They were able to see um, the education teams, so the groups of teachers working in each subject, were articulating the essential learning um, with projects in those teams. So the teams would come up with projects and they'd talk about what do we need our kids to know and what else is, is just you know additional or extra. Um, and they felt that there was an improvement of the school environment. Um, now, this little case study was given before they'd readministered PISA for Schools. So obviously, they're hoping that in the next cycle of PISA for Schools data, they'll see the, the same chart will be much improved and that, that they'll have some more quantitative and firm data to go with what they've already observed qualitatively, what they've already seen has improved in, the, in their school group. One thing I think to highlight about this is that the school has picked just one issue. They're not trying to eat, to fix everything all at once. They've picked one thing that they think is of core importance and they've thought through different ways of trying to encourage students and teachers to work together to be responsive to the needs of the students and, 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 and to be aware of the efforts the teacher is making to meet them halfway. Um, so I think it's a, a good case study of, of a, a small piece of data, one table, uh, three questions from the questionnaire, making really big changes and impactful changes in this particular school and, and for the school environment as a whole. Um, another point to make 
is that Pearson for Schools only measures the 15-year-olds in your school. But this teacher training and this giving students the voice is something that washes back across all age groups in the school. So you've got data from just one cohort that's leading to change across the whole school. And that that's a um, an important point to make as well. There's utility in data, even if it's not from all of the students. There are things which can lead to benefits for all students. All right, I'll give you another uh, example as well. So this school is Barro Branco in uh, a pretty poor area of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Um, it's a really big school. There's about 18, well, <laughs> it's really big uh, by some countries' standards. I know schools in India tend to be pretty large as well, actually. But this school has 1,800 students every day, um, split into 57 classes. And uh, back in 2020, and um, of course, there was COVID and there were school shutdowns and students were having to learn from home. Many of the students that went to this school uh, live in poverty and, and didn't have access to um, all of the, the infrastructure that they needed in order to continue learning. Um, the Brazilian government, uh, though, did give them access uh, by making uh, mobile data free for, for students and teachers and gave them a tool with which they could still connect with school. And so Barrow Branco had, had their PISA for Schools results in 2020, and they thought that their maths results were below their national average, but given their population, they're not too worried about that. You know, you need to have reasonable expectations for the schools, for the students that you have. You, you want them to do the absolute best they can, obviously, but it's always the best they can given circumstances because we're working at a large scale. And so they weren't too worried that their, their school results were a little bit below their national mean. Um, what they were worried about, though, was growth and progress and maintaining it through disruption and making sure that the students were still learning and still getting better, uh, even despite the challenges. And so they encouraged their staff to take up Google Classrooms and YouTube. Um, and on the ACT side of this slide, there's a couple of uh, pictures. So... Um, Kablan is one of the teachers from the school at Barrow Blanco, and he has a YouTube channel, um, which is quite bright and colourful and, and appealing to youth. Um, and he posted uh, videos about maths. Um, he would register for um, public exams so that he could get copies of test questions. And then he'd do videos of working through test questions as ways of revision and supporting the students, um, not just from this school, uh, but from, you know, it, it's a public YouTube channel, so everybody could access the materials, but especially students from this school who knew this teacher and who knew that he lived locally and close to the school would follow him and, and do their maths in, um, even through disruption. And what they saw between 2020 and 2021 is that across the substrands of maths, um, their, their students, uh, the, the average of the 15 year olds moved up about around about 30 to 40 score points, um, which in terms of effect size is about 0.3. So it's about a third of a standard deviation uh, difference between 2020 and 2021, um, which is quite significant. Uh, any, any intervention that you do in your school that can push the mean a third of a standard deviation in the right direction is a very successful intervention. Um, if you're not a numbers person, you might not uh, understand how significant that is, uh, but I'm sure you, you'll have numbers people in your lives who will be able to, to explain it to you. You'll just have to trust me. And so the essential thing about this was that they looked at their school report. They didn't panic about low scores. They did understand the context of what was happening with, with COVID, and they thought, what can we do as a school to ensure that our students not only maintain their level, but thrive. And they found innovative ways to support their students and they saw the results. Focusing on actions and worrying about results later is often a good way to go about life, isn't it? So you do the right thing and, and the good things will follow just from making the right choices. And for them, the right choices was meeting the students where they're at, ensuring they were engaged with school, ensuring they kept up with their learning, and then they were able to see the results later on. Um, yeah. 
So those are the two case studies I have for you. Um, I hope they were interesting and, and that you could see some commonalities maybe between your schools and uh, the context of, of these these schools. Um, and maybe it's given you some ideas. Maybe it's given you a lot of questions. Um, and so I'll get uh, Kavish maybe to, to moderate and pitch some questions. Super. Thank you so much, Nate. Uh, no matter how much we have interacted together on this topic, it's always something new that I can pick from your sessions. And I can first share the three picks for me from today's session. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure these may be similar for a lot of other educators here. One in the multi-step flowchart that you had, I saw that as very powerful because, you know, the second box really challenged us to think, does this result conform to your past data and experience, right? And I think a lot of times when we get external data validation or diagnostic reports, we tend to miss out or underrate our own past data and experience. And unless we contextually read these massive reports, we mm -hmm. will miss the point. So I picked that as one key insight today. Uh, second, uh, you mentioned that, you know, the data will give you so many outputs, but you need to pick one thing and go after it. You know, when you go after it, you, you will get the output. And the third was, which is very contextually relevant for the audience here with us this evening, is the findings that you're getting from 15-year-olds is actually not just relevant for them. The practices are going to be taken across the school years, right? So, uh, so it's, it's, it's a far deeper, larger impact than one would envisage uh, through, through such an exercise. So really, really, those were my top three picks. Before I come to the questions, I just want to quickly request to the, the educators out here, all of us who are working with schools here, go for a very long day. We literally start our days here at 6.30 a.m. or even earlier in India. And by the time we get back home, it's not before 4 p.m. or could be even later. So a lot of you have been keeping your videos off. But for this part, wherein we have Q&A, as many of you who can keep your videos on, It'll be nice to see all of you. Uh, it, it's almost like a panel on the stage and we have some wonderful educators out here. And the questions that I'm picking with Nate for the next few minutes are all from you who had the time uh, to you know write to us before the session. Thank you for writing in. So Nate, let me begin with the same question again. Uh, I am somebody who is scared of data and numbers. What are the necessary skills or first steps that you expect a teacher or an educator to break that barrier with numbers or skills that you recommend we should acquire? I think the, the most important attribute to overcome that is curiosity. You have to want to learn and not on order, not, not to learn maths for its own sake or data for its own sake. You need to have the goal in mind, which is helping your students. Because if you set that as your goal, everything else will fall into place. So set that as your goal. I, I need to understand this so that I can plan to help my students. Then, of course, you draw on other people around you. You have a team. You know, School leadership is not a, an isolated project. It's not one person doing everything. It, it is a team and you have good people. You will have picked good people to gather around you to support you. So draw on the ones who have some more quantitative background and don't just ask them to interpret it for you, but sit with them and ask them to talk you through it because doing and understanding in context is often more powerful uh, than, you know, doing something in theory or from a textbook and then trying to apply it yourself. Using your data to learn how to read your data is always going to be more meaningful and always more aligned with that goal of helping your students. So curiosity, relying on the people around you and using your data to teach yourself about how to read your data. I think of my top three tips for that. Lovely. Love it. And I think curiosity, there's no age to it. We, we can no. learn every time something new out of it. Thank you for evoking that once again. Uh, you ended your session with something, you may have said it very casually, but in India, you know, it comes from some of our scriptures that all of us look up to, which is, uh, you said that do the right practices, results will follow. It's almost like in Hindi, we say, karm karo, palki mat karo, right? It's, it's like you do your job, results will come. 
And my next question is a lot of times with educators in India, we keep hearing this, that there is no connection between student performance and pedagogical practices, right? Uh, that we have our pedagogical practices as per our own independent plan, and it's not connected to what's happening inside classroom. Do you see this as a valid concern or a concern that, that comes across in other countries? And how do you address this? I mean, I I don't see it as a concern because I, I really do think that, that right practices bring fruit. Like it, it, it is the case that if you have engaged teachers in a classroom, being responsive to your students' needs, working with them to take the next steps in their learning, then their performance must improve. If there is a disconnect between what you observe when you watch your teachers and what you see in the reports from a test, there are other possible explanations. The first one could be that maybe the test is not measuring what your teachers are teaching. Maybe there's a misalignment between your curriculum and, and, and the particular assessment that you're looking at. Um, I said before, you know, the way that reading is measured in PISA is, is not necessarily the way that reading is taught in schools. And so this can cause, uh, it can cause it to look like the practices have no effect on performance, if that's the case. But actually, there's more going on there to understand and unpack. The other thing is that sometimes the, the amount of growth or the speed of growth isn't um, aligned well to the, the scale of the test. So maybe the growth is in centimetres and the ruler is in metres. And so there's a big difference between one metre and two metres. But if a student's grown 20 centimetres, that doesn't mean they haven't grown it just means that your test is saying one and two instead of one point two, you know, and and so there can be other there can be other reasons why you might not see growth in the results even though you see improvement in the practice. But I think ultimately over time the growth will catch up to whatever test that you're applying, and ultimately selecting the right test and making the use of the data in the right ways will help you understand where your student's growth is reflected in the data. Um, so yeah, I, they, they are connected. It, it must be the case that what a teacher does leads to student growth. The question is, are we measuring that growth well and are we able to see it in the results that we're getting? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this. And this triggers two kinds of questions that we received from the educators. One is uh, doing global benchmark assessments or some assessment once in, let's say a couple of years for us to get a diagnostic outside in view of our practices, which is PISA for schools first as a good example that all of us have signed up for. The other is, as we go higher up in grades, let's say grade 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, the frequency and the rigor of testing in schools tend to be very high in India, right? So how? what do you think is the right balance? If we have got a benchmark assessment, a diagnostic about our system, and we are working on our system improvement, do we really need to be reliant on periodic rigorous testing of students' uh, skills and learning outcomes? What's your view on that? I think that the, the assessment system in a school needs to be carefully thought through because there needs to be balance. You do need some, rigor, some rigorous assessments to give you a certain type of data. You also need ways of capturing teacher feedback and teacher observations of working with the students. So not the summative assessment, but the formative assessment. How are the students doing and how are they feeling and, and getting a bigger picture? And it creates a, a mosaic of different pieces of data and different sources of data to understand the whole. And I think it, it's very often the case that in senior skills, senior years of schooling, it skews very heavily towards the, the high pressure uh, exams. And the, there's often large burdens placed on students in those higher ones. And some of that is for good reason. And some of it could maybe be replaced with different forms of assessment. I think what the key is, as school leaders looking at the system as a whole, is to understand how many assessments are going on, when they're happening, and is there enough time between them to see results change? And are all of them really necessary? Um, it, it, 
there needs to be a really holistic view, you know, across these years that we have these students, how often are we measuring them? Why are we measuring them? And, and are there other ways of doing it, which might be better for other things, you know, better for the students, mental health, not putting them under so much pressure or better for our teachers to have data that's easily accessible and understood by them. Um, and yeah, the, planning the system as a whole, I think is really important and, and a much bigger conversation in many ways. And Pisa for Schools is just one of the tiles in the mosaic. Yeah. And I think one of the things that Pisa for Schools does is a very interesting student questionnaire where we get to know about learners' motivation, the socio-emotional environment. So I think if we map our assessment design to student motivation, that also could be more sensible than designing an assessment system independent of student motivation. I just felt like adding to uh, the response that you gave. Mm -hmm. The other dimension that we keep thinking on is, you know, the moment there is more assessment, somewhere it interferes with our learning with fun, learning with spontaneity, right? As in, uh, and you mentioned in your example as well that in, in Portugal, wherein you were looking at responsiveness, teacher responsiveness to different learner needs, uh, I think that's far better than uh, using only data for mm. uh, for spontaneity. Do you have any comments on data-driven practices versus spontaneous uh, education in the classroom mm. uh, for interfering with learning with fun? I, I think people hear data and they think only of numbers and high-stakes assessment. And, you know, there, there are two types of data. There's qualitative and there's quantitative. And, and often we need all of it to, to paint the correct picture. And, you know, the cognitive part of Pisa for Schools, the, the reading, the maths, the science, this is very much the, the quantitative, you know, it's about scale scores, it's about standard deviations, it's about uh, confidence intervals. But that other part of the questionnaire is much more qualitative, much more experience driven. You know, how, how often does your teacher do this? How often are you feeling this way? How often do you do this? And getting more of a it, it's still quantitative because it's, you know, percentages of students that feel this way or frequencies, but it's getting towards that softer side. And then your teachers in your classrooms actually see the qualitative. They see how the students are feeling and engaging with tasks, and they will change their practices based on how, you know, how bored a student is looking or how much fun and glee they see in their students when they're doing it a particular task. And so that that qualitative feedback, that that understanding students one on one and understanding how they're feeling is is super important. And it is also data. Observation is data, right? Observation yields data, I should say. And and so that ex classroom experience really needs to be valued, and it, it cannot be replaced by standardized tests. It cannot be replaced by by you know the number of correct answers on a test, it it needs to be there as well, and and part of the learning assessment system in your school needs to have opportunities for funneling as much data into one source as it can, and that includes the the feedback and and the experience of teachers and students as much as possible. Well, thank you for that. In fact, uh, one of the questions that came to us was India is participating in Peace of our schools for the first time, right? And India is the 16th country to do this uh, ever. Uh, and we are wondering that how would we accelerate our learning journey with Peace of our schools because our country is participating the first time? Uh, would these experiences that you have from other countries who have signed up for Peace of our schools be available for participating schools in India? Uh, is there something that we can look forward to from some of the published work of OECD uh, to contextualize that to our reports, you have any guidance on that? Uh, this one I don't have too much guidance on. Um, the the Pisa for Schools team is always working on post assessment things, um, and I'm not I'm not uh, quite up to speed with what their plans are at the minute. Um, I know they are looking heavily at the school reports, um, and they're looking at at what they're going to be putting in there in terms of benchmarking and and the way that data is presented and those sorts of things. Um, but I'm sure that they're working on other other collaborative peer learning opportunities for for schools in India to learn from other schools. Um, and of course, Excel One will be organizing webinars and, and inviting people to share experiences as well. So I'm sure there are plans. I'm just not very sure what they are. <laughs> 
No, sure. As in, and I can take part of that question as a representative of piece of a school's team, your colleagues. So mm. one is, uh, apart from our own India-specific webinars, we keep offering the OECD international webinars to our participating schools to learn from. Second is, of course, post the report is uh, issued to you, there will be a report session for making you understand what this report is actually uh, contextually making sense. Third, as uh, Nate also mentioned, there's a peer learning group. There is a group uh, globally who have been part of this journey. So we will be part of the peer learning group to exchange notes and understand what they picked up. That's a third specific opportunity that we definitely have. And, and I'm sure we can ask for more. Uh, something that uh, your colleagues at OECD PISA for Schools keep telling us is uh, we have been very demanding and our demands have been fulfilled because no one else in the past have asked for it. So we will continue that in the future. So Nate, as we are talking about this, one of the challenge we keep coming across in India, or maybe it's true for other countries, is how significant component is technology, both software and the personalized hardware devices in capturing data, right? As in most of our schools here in India will have a common computer lab uh, or a few computers in the teacher staff room, but personalized devices or technology in the classroom is still not, I wouldn't say more than more than 5% school or even lesser would have that in India. Mm -hmm. Is it important technology for capturing data? I, I, it's not a yes or no question, I think. There, there's always multiple ways to do something and you adapt what you do to the tools you have available. So where there is technology available and it can be used, like, of course, you can use it to capture data. You can do all kinds of things um, with, with ICTs. Um, but where it's not available, there's, there's still tried and tested methods. For, for assessment uh, on pen and paper. Um, and of course, teachers are, aren't using any technology when they're observing their students or interacting with them or talking to them um, when they're in the classroom together. I mean, ov obviously these days, there's all these things about online schools and there's different ways to interact with students throughout the school day and there's flipped learning and there's all these, there's all these different methods that come with different tools. But, you know, you use what you have available to its fullest extent to achieve the goals that you set for yourselves. And, and so I don't think it's a drawback to not have access to the technology. Um, I don't think people will fall behind uh, just because they don't have it, but when it becomes available, absolutely embrace it and make the use of, make use of it because there, there are opportunities in all new things. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't see it as, as a, as a big problem to have different resources to somewhere else. Okay. So uh, as we are like the last 15, 20 minutes of the session and uh, some of the questions of our participants were addressed by Nate in his presentation itself. So we may be able to take a few questions live from anyone who would like to ask them. So in case uh, I'll come to you uh, while I finish a few more questions, in case you have a question you wish to ask Nate here, you can raise your Zoom hand. Uh, we will be able to see your hand, uh, the Zoom hand not this hand. It'll be easier if you raise that and we'll come back to you shortly. Uh, so Nate, uh, one of the things that I know you are a champion at and uh, it may be connected directly to the session or not, but I think creating high quality test items is very important, right? You mentioned in your presentation as well somewhere that what are we measuring? A lot of times we, we don't know. You also gave an example of scale. You may have a scale of meters and your children are progressing at centimeters, right? So what what are the critical success factors or good practices to become a high quality test item creator, especially mm -hmm. to give you context from India, we are moving towards competency-based assessment as a country under the new education policy, which was released in 2020, right in the middle of COVID. So do you have, would you be able to take a quick crash course on this? I know you can run days of workshops on this. Yeah, the, the the shortest course I've ever run on this was three days. So, uh, but I but I could try and give you a a pretty quick one. So, um, educational measurement uh, came about from a, as an extension of physical measurement, and so a lot of the principles are the same, and and the analogies we use are, are very similar as well. We talk about rulers and things like that. So, 
The first thing that you need to do in order to measure anything is to define what it is you are measuring. You need to say, I am trying to look at one particular attribute of something. So if I'm trying to measure a rock, I can measure its weight, and that's one attribute of it. Or I can measure its color, and that's another one. Or I can measure its circumference, and that's another. And no measurement tool that I have can do all of it. If I'm trying to measure the size of something, I need a ruler. If I'm trying to measure the weight, I need a scale. Um, and so you need to think about assessments in the same way for, for children. You need to know what aspect of the child am I trying to measure and what tool do I need to do that? And once you understand what it is you're measuring and what kind of a tool you need, that's when you can start writing the tool because or creating it. And you need to have an idea of what sort of performance you're trying to elicit from a child. If I'm trying to measure your drawing skill, it's no good giving you numbers questions. You know, I, I need to align what I'm asking you to do with what it is I'm trying to measure. And in developing the questions, I need to keep that always in my mind. Does this question elicit a response from a student that tells me something about the attribute that I'm trying to measure? And so this is about alignment, alignment of theory with practice to get an observation that directly relates to what you're trying to measure. And when we're looking at large scale assessments and PISA style assessments, every individual item is just one small observation of an elicited skill. And you need to think about how you build that up so that you get the necessary breadth and you get the necessary depth. So you need a range of difficulty and you need a range of performances that tell you about the attribute. So at a really high level uh, concept, that is where you need to start in order to improve the quality of your assessments. Know what it is you're measuring, how you're measuring it, and how to line those things up. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of days of workshops. <laughs> yeah. But that, that's, that's, the, that's the short answer. Yeah, I think uh, that's the shortest. And as Nate said, his shortest workshop on this topic has been three days. Uh, and we know for a matter of fact that he's going to be in India in October for a closed user group. Uh, and I think that's another five days of workshop. Uh, it is five, yep. Five, five days, days of, on just high quality test item creation. So the, the, the level of science and art that we are talking about in this is quite deep. And we are looking forward, Nate, that this group will also get an opportunity within the next 12 months of first PISA cycle to have a three day, if not five day with you in, in India. That would be, that would be great. I, I'd love that. Yes. Yes. No, interesting. And as, as we were chatting, one interesting question popped up uh, for me on the screen from one of the participants is, have you come across very innovative out of the box assessment anywhere in the world? As in you never expected an assessment to be like that. Uh, it's a, that's a, that's a, that's a question I've not been asked before. Um, things that surprise me in assessment. Um, okay. I can think of two things that, that I don't know enough about that. I really want to learn more about. So the first one, uh, is the uses of AI in assessment. So there are companies that are working very hard on not only, um, item generation, so getting the AI to produce new items and put them in front of students. But also on the back end, there's, there's all kinds of um, psychometrics that go on. And usually it's done um, after the test is over. So you, you get all the students' responses and you analyze them with using quantitative methods and then you come up with, with the results. But there, is, uh, there are there are organizations where the AI is in the background of the test doing that on the fly as the test is being taken. Um, and it's producing some very interesting results in, and it's being, a, it's measuring students in ways that we, we haven't been able to do it before. So that, that amazes me, um, the, the use of technology and AI technologies in real time in assessments. 
Um, and the other one, which I think's dropped off a lot, but which I I still think hasn't reached its full potential, is, is gamifying assessment. Um, I've seen some excellent work on on not just measuring the outcomes of what a student has as their final answer, but the process that they get there, and having test interfaces which are you know are like games where you are observing the process, not just the final result. Um, and I think there's a lot more to be done there. But I, some of the things I see surprise me about how how well and and how interesting the data is that come out of them. So to all our participants here, uh, I have enough questions to take the next one out as well. So I will uh, bring your question up in case you have a question live here. You can raise your Zoom hand. Just to come back to you, Nate, on uh, another thing. You know, India uh, is right now moving towards a massive reform in assessments. And I think we are very happy, at least where we are directionally indicated to move towards as a community of schools. One example is one of the national boards, one of the larger national boards, CBSC, uh, Central Board. Uh, they uh, did the SAFAL assessment last year, and it clearly said SAFAL is not to pass or fail a child, a student. SAFAL is a diagnostic for the system, for the school, for the network. Mm -hmm. And I think I was feeling so happy because it relieves pressure from two ends. One, the learner, because learner is feeling pressurized for being passed or fail on a test. And even the teachers who are doing the hard work, right? A lot of times our teachers are doing all the hard work trying to get learning outcomes better. But depending on the output of a test, our teachers also get pulled up for uh, suboptimal performance compared to what somebody expected. So is, is this practice, you've seen this anywhere else in the world wherein in a country where systems are assessed and not children or teachers? Yeah, um, it's, it's a tension. Uh, and it, and it, in some places it, it happens and some it doesn't. So... Let me think about other systems I've seen. Um, PISA is an example of one that doesn't report at the student level. So you don't get any student level results out of PISA. Um, and the same with the OECD's other surveys. So um, with uh, PIAC, which is the adult one, and IELS, which is a five-year-old one, the the students are not re reported. And, and PISA for schools is the same. Um, it's about measuring the, the school, not about measuring the students. In some places in the world, they try and do it all. They try and make their assessment a, a bit of a Swiss army knife, if you will. So in, in a context I know well, the Australian one, the national assessment there is reported at a national level and a state level, um, and uh, to some extent at a school level, but the, it's a little bit less public um, because they don't want schools to try and rank themselves against each other. They just want the information mapped for the schools. So there's that purpose there of system monitoring while also delivering student results, which is in some ways pulling in two directions. Because like you said, if, if it's about measuring a student, the student feels pressure and it becomes high stakes. And sometimes we don't want that. We want to observe the system in the absence of creating high stakes environments because there's all sorts of incentives created with high stakes tests, which we might not intend. Um, in our creation. Um, but yeah, I, I think most most countries that I can think of in the world try and do both at the same time, um, which is often very difficult. <laughs> and and uh, But yeah, uh, particularly at the system-wide level, they try and get a system-wide one, but also give feedback to students. I think PISA and the international assessments are exceptions um, in that so regard. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, just to switch quickly to the student side, the learner side, I think PISA for Schools does a fantastic job on uh, capturing what the student is feeling and, you know, how motivated the student is. Could you just elaborate a bit more about that section of PISA for Schools experience and how it's so important for us as educators to look at that data or insight as much as we look at the reading math science data? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in PISA proper, there's a large student questionnaire and there's also a, a school questionnaire as well um, but in PISA for schools we just have the student questionnaire at the moment and in the student questionnaire there are some social emotional skills um, I think they're still in there um, and there's a lot of uh, questions about um, uh, their, their experience of learning in the classroom 
Um, so you get a picture of how the students, how the cohort as a whole are in their skills in terms of talking to each other and, and also some information about how they're feeling in their classroom in, in their lessons with their teachers. Um, and there's also a global competence module in there as well, which is about intercultural attitudes and um, uh, intercultural attitudes and global competence, which and global competence is about their um, their self-efficacy in um, making change in the world, in taking action and civic participation and those sorts of things. So you you get some information which you might not get out of a traditional assessment because it's not that the classroom based, it's not curriculum based stuff. It's, it's things about experience and it th things about opinions and attitudes that go well beyond just what they know and can do. Um, and one of the things about having it in the same data set, of course, is that you can also um, break down some of the results by some of those, um, some of those variables. So, you know, you're able to do secondary analysis on data sets um, where you can say, right, I have this variable that asks, question, uh, asks a question about how important they see maths for their future career. And then you can split that, split the um, group into that variable and understand how well they do in maths. So you can end up with understanding things like kids who see maths as important for their future career do better, or maybe they don't, um, and, and, and find interesting interactions between some of these qualitative attributes or these, these um, socio-emotional attributes or these other sorts of competencies and their cognitive assessment. Um, so there's all sorts of, uh, of, of information there that you can dig out and that you can do further analysis on, which is very interesting for a lot of people. Uh, and not so interesting for others. It kind of depends what kind of a person you are. <laughs> yeah. And and as we are talking, and I think a related question that I'm seeing here on the screen is, is, is the outcome of piece of a school's assessment also somewhere reflecting about the system, specifically the teacher's performance as well? Because it may be the learner motivation. It may be the conditions in the school, the infrastructure, the socioeconomic background. How much of a correlation is it with teacher performance or teacher quality? Um, piece of a schools in particular isn't a very good measure of teacher performance. I'll, I'll put it that way. And But here are the reasons for that. So at, at the first one, it reports at a cohort level. So we we don't split results by class. We, we have it as year group. So in most schools, not all, but in most schools, you'll have multiple teachers teaching in a year group. So there's no way to differentiate between which students were with each teacher. So at that level, you can't get information on relative efficacy of the different teachers what you get information on though is perhaps your staff as a whole as a team you know if your school is doing this well it means that your team is doing this well um, and the other thing is that that often with competence-based education or, or competence by curriculum where competences are emphasized let's put it that way is that it's a cumulative effect of education it's not what have they learned this year and this is how well they've done. It's you are 15 years old and you've been in this school this long and now you're able to show us that you can do these things. So it's not just about the, the teachers in the year group that they are. It's also about the building blocks that were laid down earlier in their education um, and about how, how the, there's this cumulative effect of a competency compared with the very specific curriculum or syllabus requirements of, you know, can they add three numeral numbers together? Can they add, you know, can they divide by whatever? So, yeah. Yeah, another uh, related but interesting question that's come up is, uh, if you look at piece of our schools, right, I'm not getting a student score. I'm not able to tag it with teacher performance or specific outcomes, but I get a very beautiful report on my system, which I can take it across my school. Now, the question is, how do I motivate these students to participate in such an assessment, right? Is a natural beat piece of a schools or any other system reflective diagnostic assessment? How do we motivate students to give their best? Uh, mm -hmm. That is one part. And the related part that people in India, at least, I don't know about other countries, maybe China, where we have this tendency of preparing for test, of tutoring for test, 
which I keep uh, educating our fellow educators in India that for a diagnostic assessment, especially these of our schools, we should not think about preparation. It's our reflection, our diagnostic. So your quick uh, opinion on this one. Uh, maybe this is my last question for this evening. Sure. Um, so with student motivation, I think one thing um, is to recognize that, you know, you're testing 15-year-olds with PISA for schools and they're they're young adults at this point. And so you can talk to them about why you're doing the test. You can be really upfront and honest with them. You know what? This isn't a test about you guys. This is your chance to show what our school's done and to make it better for future. You know, this is your chance to let us see where you're at and what you think in the student questionnaire about our, our learning environments as a way for us to plan for the, the younger students below you to, to, to have, a better, have it better than you did. So this is an opportunity for them to give back. So I think having a really open and honest conversation with them before the test about why you're doing the test can give them a sense of actually, I should take this seriously. I shouldn't feel pressure about doing well because it's not about me, but I should take it seriously because this is about the other people who are around me and about this school that's given me so much. So I think if you treat them as responsible young adults and, and, and be open and honest with them, the majority of them are going to respond well to that and, and be motivated um, to, do, to do their best on, on the test. And then the second part was, I've forgotten. What was the second part? No, the second part is tutoring and preparing for these tests. Which oh, are the not tutoring, meant. yeah. So so again, like this, uh, being a competence-based assessment, it, it's about cumulative skill over time. It's not about specific preparation on specific content. So there's no cramming you can do for the maths assessment. Uh, because it's not linked to any particular curriculum or any particular textbook. So you can't sit there and study all night the night before. It's about, you know, if you are put into this situation in this scenario, do you have the tools and the competence to approach it and, and find a solution? Uh, and it's similar with reading and, and with science as well. Like it, it, it's not something to prepare for. It's just a, an observation of where the skill level is at that's a, a cumulative result of their use of education to that point. Super. I think we have gone past 6 p.m. And if I were to hold Nate back with us for further time, I think the only reason we can hold him back is this. Uh, as I shared my top three picks from his presentation, maybe if any of you would like to share your top three picks or top one pick from this session so far, uh, please let us know. We'll unmute you and you can share right away. And I think that will be a great gift to gift back to Nate for his incredible one hour with all of us this uh they have a beautiful office i've had the chance to be there lovely coffee so anyone who can gift him with sharing what were your top takeaways today maybe one two uh anyone I, i've seen a lot of you are very very attentive throughout the session some of you were in and out, but I'm sure the ones with video off also, you were fully with us through this one hour. Okay, uh, Dor Dorin, uh, one sec, let me unmute you. Yes. So uh, good evening all, and uh, I don't know, I mean, I was just trying to catch up with uh, Sir, and what I understand is like, it's kind of like math, reading and uh, science oriented, kind of a competitive exam that we, I mean, just for an example, like, you know, Azer and Chem and SOF, like kind of a uh, uh, competitive exam. Once again, uh, to scaffold their learning and give back, uh, uh, I mean, the feedback as such, uh, I don't know, I've, I've attempted well or no, but just what I understood in uh, nutshell and crust. So um, for the betterment of students learning once again, that's what I understand. But uh, when we start looking at it, I mean, in depth, only then I think a lot of doubts will come and only then I can go ahead and cl get it clarified, I guess. Thank sure. you. Super. Thank you so much, uh, Don, ma'am. As much as you are learning, we are learning with you. Uh, this is the first year for uh, us in India. Uh, one sec. Uh, Sonika, let's unmute uh, Sugandhi, ma'am. 
Hi, hi, Kavish. Yes, hi, uh, Nate. Uh, see, I joined late, but then it was very informative. I thank Nate for clarifying that it is not the individual test of a student or the teacher per se. So that apprehension is taken away, first thing. Mm. Second thing is a lot of teachers would have dealt with students and the student learning would have grown, you know, uh, literally over the years. And it's a cumulative assessment of the student's understanding of a subject, deeper understanding and application of whatever he has learned over a period of years, which is amazing. I feel as a school, we need to know where we stand as far as the, the cognitive uh, part of the child is concerned. And I am a little curious about one or two things. It's about the socio-emotional uh, uh, patient that you are measuring, psychometrics that you are measuring. I'm still a little inquisitive about it, uh, but that's one great aspect that we need to test and assess uh, because uh, going forward, I think emotional intelligence is going to conquer the whole world. With AI, AI coming in, the only difference we have with computers is emotional intelligence. And thank you, Nate, for uh, clarifying a lot of things. Even though I attended only for half an hour, last half an hour, I got to know of it late. Thank you so much for clarifying our doubts. Whatever doubts we have, we will get back to you, Kavish, on this. Sure. Thank sure. you. Thank you, Sugandhi, ma'am. Thank uh, you. We had a raise of hand in the chat from Anjali, uh, ma'am, first. So go ahead, ma'am. So, good evening. It was a wonderful session. This is my third session with you. So, in this, I wanted to say, yes, as rightly said, that the children competency level needs to be assessed. Or for that, the school has to prepare in a most on a way that it is not a competitive edge that they have to perform, but they're making them responsible adult, as rightly mentioned. So I just wanted to know, is there any way where they have a structured assessments with you all so that thinking, critical thinking, competency level can be you know, enhanced by asking? Because good if you want good answers, we need to have good questions. Yes. Thank, thank you, ma'am. As in, uh, Nate did briefly touch upon that. And as he mentioned, it's a very elaborate topic. We will okay. learn more as we move forward in this journey okay. together. Yes. Sure. So. Thank you so much, ma'am. And Supriya, ma'am, we are unmuting you. And as we unmute you, I just want to mention that uh, in the audience, you always pick a few favorites. So you were one of the favorites this evening. You were so attentive. It's almost like we were making eye contact with you throughout this session. So thank you for your full presence, ma'am. Uh, you can unmute yourself now. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kavish and uh, uh, Mr. Nate. Good evening to everybody present. Uh, I was just very excited to know about the fact that you are having a lot of questionnaires uh, where would where we would be uh, finding the fee taking feedback from the students of exactly how they feel. Um, while they are uh, doing the assessments, are they feeling pressured or are they, uh, you know, as he's, uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Nate said, that do they really like maths and they feel that, uh, you know, it is going to help them in the future and uh, that is why they are doing well in maths or it, is it due to any kind of pressure from... Sorry, I think by mistake you got muted somewhere. Uh, one sec. Yeah, yeah, now I'm back. Yeah. So I am just excited to learn and to see that in future when we take the, uh, you know, the students feedback, which is very, very important. And most of the times in Indian schools, uh, we uh, don't give so much importance to student feedback. So that is the place where I want to see that how much of difference that can make into the learning environment of the school as a whole. So thank you so much for your time, uh, Mr. Nate and Mr. Kavish. Thank you. So we'll take the last word from Shweta, ma'am. And thank you again, Shweta, ma'am, to you as well for being super attentive with all of us through this session. Thank you, Mr. Kavish. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Mr. Kavish and Mr. Nate. It was such informative and very impressive session. Thank you for the session, sir. And uh, as far as my thoughts go, 
it the session gave us a cumulative uh, record of all the results that we would be getting, all kinds of results that we would be getting. And the best takeaway was that now we would know where the level of comprehension of our students stand when they take up this examination at this age category that we have selected within the uh, for the examination. And also it will tell us what impro improvisations we need to make at the lower levels, which can lead us to a better result in comparison to the other international schools. So we would really love to take up this session with you further also and the examination also. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you to all of you and Nate, thank you so much. I know how much adding 10 more minutes to the calendar is. I know we would have spilled over to your next commitment, which is maybe right around the corner. Uh, we can't be more grateful to this wonderful session with you. Anything else, Nate, that you wish us to leave with, with as your last message for all of us so that we remember it? And Just a very, with. very big thank you. I, I think it, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And, and, you know, people come to these webinars because they are passionate about their students doing reaching their potential and, and, and achieving, uh, you know, all of the growth that they can. And, and what, what is more noble than trying to get the next generation to achieve um, better than what we did. So thank you very much for being engaged in, in, in and being interested in school improvement. And, and I hope that Pisa for Schools helps your schools on their journey to uh, improvement and growth. Super. Thank you, Nate. Have a wonderful rest of the week and a lovely evening to all of you before you are back in your schools right next morning, 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m., <laughs> as early as that. Bye. See you all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.